and even just in terms of our day-to-day lives? Why, what's the big deal about attention? Right. It's a great opening question. And I go back to the title of the conference itself, The Science of Meditation. And the root of the word of science is knowing, knowing what is true, seeing clearly. And it's interesting that, as you know, the root of the word for Buddha, Budo, is to know, to see what's true and to penetrate through ignorance, delusion, and confusion, which creates so much suffering and harm for ourselves and other people. So it is very interesting to think of the common roots of the, if you will, Western tradition of science, which is now, of course, uh, global, and the more Eastern traditions of contemplative practice, uh, including exemplified by Buddhism, that are both grounded fundamentally in the same trunk of the tree of knowing. So... How do we know? Well, we know fundamentally by placing our attention on something. You know, there's the old line, you are what you eat. Actually, the modern update, based on what's called experience-dependent neuroplasticity, is that you are what you pay attention to, and more exactly, what you do with what you pay attention to. Because attention, in terms of uh, its functions for us as biological, embodied, creatures, living animals. Attention functions as like a vacuum cleaner with a spotlight on it. It illuminates what it rests upon and then sucks it into our brain. Because uh, in the traditional saying, the mind takes its shape from what it repeatedly rests upon. The modern update would be your brain and therefore much, if not all of you, fundamentally your experience of living, takes its shape from what your mind rests upon. So therefore, getting regulation over and uh, real-time mindfulness of where your attention is being placed is incredibly useful. Uh, There's kind of a famous saying in brain science, neurons that fire together, wire together. And that process of structure building and lasting change, where we hardwire into ourselves what we are paying attention to, is really turbocharged for what's in the field of consciousness. So I think that's why, just to finish here, it's so important to be able to get some kind of awareness of where your attention goes, especially in the world that we live in, which is grabbing attention and pulling in all kinds of different directions. And then based on where, what your attention rests upon, practicing skillfully with what's there. So that over time, bit by bit by bit, as the Buddha guides us and as all kinds of other great teachers and modern scientists and psychologists today guide us, you can gradually nudge yourself over time, bit by bit, in a better and better direction, you know, for your own sake and the sake of other beings. Marketers, the media advertisers, uh, social media developers and so forth have learned how to train our attention. Yeah. How about ourselves? Can we learn to train our own attention? Yeah, there's much research um, about uh, meditation in particular and mindfulness in general as a way to train attention. And we become more able, many, many studies show, to place our attention on what we care about, pull our attention away from things that we don't care about so much, and become less driven by stimulation hunger. You know, this need for the next thing, right, to, fill, to help ourselves feel filled up. And in the process of that kind of attention training, there's some measurable changes in neural structure or function that are very interesting. I'll go through some of them kind of quickly here. Uh, they're both really cool, and they illustrate the fruits of practice, which is good for many reasons, including helping to motivate ourselves to, you know, keep going, keep doing it. Uh, And by the way, you don't have to be a perfect meditator. You don't have to go on beyond retreat all the time. Uh, A lot of little things add up over time, but there's a technical term in neuropsychology, mo better, more better. In other words, more episodes of practice and more depth of engagement in your episodes of practice, which will go especially the latter to what I have a particular interest in, uh, helping yourself turbocharge your growth curve. In other words, helping yourself when you are engaged in practice to really receive the fruits into yourself in a lasting way. They ultimately get hardwired into your own body rather than simply having some kind of beneficial experience that doesn't make any lasting difference. And I'm sure we'll get to that more later. Uh, Meanwhile, how does meditation practice or mindfulness practice more generally change the brain? 
One, it tends to increase uh, activation of the left prefrontal regions relative to right prefrontal regions. This is switched for roughly half of all left-handed people, but I'll just speak about the majority of people here. And that's good because your left prefrontal cortex is involved in approaching the good rather than avoiding the bad, which is more the province of the right hemisphere of the brain. And the left hemisphere of the brain, or particularly left frontal, is also more involved in the regulation of negative emotion, putting the brakes on fear or anger or feeling hurt or ashamed. So you get more positive experiences, more well-being when you increase the strength of your brakes. That's one very reliable result from meditative practice. Uh, another benefit is that uh, if you repeatedly meditate, you tend to build up cortex, you know, layers of uh, tissue, uh, you thicken it, building up more synaptic connections and bringing more blood flow to parts of the brain in the frontal regions that help regulate attention and emotion and action kind of top down. And also you build up cortex in a part of the brain, I'm pointing to my temporal lobes here, on the inside of the temporal lobes called the insula, which is important because it helps us tune into ourselves. And that's what you're doing when you're meditating, right? You're regulating attention, you're building up that muscle right behind your forehead, and you're also tuning into yourself. You're building up that muscle too, that's the insula. And you become more self-aware and you get a bonus benefit because the insula is very involved in empathy for the feelings of others. And that's really good, all right? So that's a very reliable result. Another third major result is that um, you build up more tissue in a part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is good because it puts things in context and calms down the alarm bell of the brain, the amygdala. That's another really nice, reliable benefit. Also, people with long-term practice tend to increase activation of what are called gamma wave brain waves, gamma range brain waves. That's important because gamma is fast, roughly 30 to 80 beats per second. That means you're synchronizing millions, potentially billions, literally of synapses. So they're all firing synchronously 30 to 80 times um, a second. That means that they're really integrated with each other. And that supports that sense of wholeness and integration that develops over time with meditation. Traditionally, sometimes it's called as a factor, unification of consciousness, singleness of mind. That's another result from long-term practice. And then the last result I'll just mention here, um, in addition to more bodily results, improving the immune system, calming down the stress response, faster recovery from being upset, that's kind of the body altogether. But just in terms of the brain, there are these little widgets at the, toward the, on, the, on the ends, if you will, of DNA molecules called telomeres. And telomeres, sometimes pronounced telomeres, but I'll say telomeres, um, are, uh, they get shorter as we get older. I don't know about you, Fleet, but I'm actually getting older. Who knew, right? And so as we get older, telomeres shrink, and as they shrink, we become more vulnerable to age-related illnesses of various kinds. Well, some recent findings have shown that meditative practice helps protect telomere lengths, these strips of atoms on the end of a super complicated molecule of DNA, so that we're more able to go into um, old age, you know, gracefully and living well. You know, it's interesting, finish here, if the great pharmaceutical companies, great in terms of size, Merck, Vice, or whatnot, if they could patent meditation already based on the proven health benefits of meditation, we'd be seeing ads for meditation every night on television and arguably even more ads than we're seeing for antidepressants or other things. I don't know if they'd replace the Viagra ads, et cetera, but we'd be seeing tons and tons of ads for meditation because of absolutely solid evidence for its benefits for physical and mental health.